great to be with you and have this opportunity, especially, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of this and uh, I don't get to travel much with my, my better half, uh, wife Teresa's with me. Would you stand up, sweetie, and just let them <laughs> she, she really does, you know, people say, secret of our success has been that I married a lady more frugal than I. And uh, so you guys, if you want to do this, uh, marry somebody that's an easy keeper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I thought a lot about what to, what to do here tonight because I knew that this would be just a really uh, rambunctious uh, group of choir members here. <laughs> and... Uh, and so I thought that I would give one that I gave for the Carbon Economy Series in uh, New Mexico uh, for the first time last year, when essentially I, I said, just, just close your eyes and imagine sitting on a rock or a, or a, a you know, tumble down tree, rotting tree trunk or something like that, um, 500 years ago, right here, where we're sitting. You know, I, I think we don't do that. We don't allow our imagination to, uh, to let us build a, or rebuild or appreciate um, that kind of a world. We, we know a lot about that world now. I mean, I mean the new, new information, whether it's, you know, the book 1493 or 1491 or um, Guns, Germs, and Steel or, you know, the Ecological Indian or, I mean, there are, there are just a, a, a amazing new discoveries that we're learning now about this landscape. Uh, ever since I can remember, since a little kid, you know, it seemed like one of my questions anytime I saw an older person was, what was it like? What was it like? You know, I'm, because I think, that, I think that permaculture at its essence is about patterns. And it's about patterns that stand the test of time. One of the, one of the things that's so unusual about our culture, and this is why I wrote the book, Folks, This Ain't Normal, is because uh, I, I see so many um, untried, first-time, unattempted patterns occurring in our culture. And tomorrow at the Mother Earth News Fair, I'll be uh, finishing, I'll be... Uh, doing the last speech of the fair on uh, uh, the title is Heretics Unite, and I'll be identifying the orthodoxy of our age. We're the heretics, and uh, and explaining um, the, the, the the heresies in the face of our culture's orthodoxy today. But tonight, I want to focus on imagine sitting in a creek or on a, on a tree log, 500 years ago, right here and try to imagine the kind of patterns that we know were existing. So, I've got 10 of them, if you're taking notes or if you're trying to remember, um, and, or if you're keeping time. You know, let's see, he's uh, you know, 30 minutes in and he's on number two, so we better get serious here. All right, so, uh, so here we go, here we go. Uh, um, number one, you would see animals everywhere. Lots of animals. You know, Captain Jim Bridger, when he was uh, commissioned to go out into the Dakotas and chart it, and he, he, he said that they got behind a herd of 7 million buffalo in the Black Hills of, of what is today the Dakotas. Um, 7 million, you know, uh, Captain Jim Bridger, I mean, this is whatever, you know, uh, 17, you know, 1790. And uh, I can just imagine uh, Captain Jim, uh, uh, Lieutenant, uh, sharpen your quill there. Uh, we got to start counting up. Okay, okay, make a chicken mark. You know, one, two, three. You know. How'd they know it's seven million? I, I don't know. But anyway, what he said was that they got behind this herd of buffalo, and if they hadn't been carrying oats for their horses, they would have all starved to death because it took them almost a week to get to a morsel of food. There was that wide a swath of devastation behind this herd of seven million buffalo. That's a lot of animals. To the best of our knowledge now, we believe that there were well over 300 million bison and 10 million wolves. Now you throw in the elk, the antelope. We know that Audubon sat under a tree. You know, the guy that drew pictures of birds. 
He sat under a tree and said, a flock of birds flew over that blocked out the sun for three days. When's the last time you saw a flock of birds? And they were probably passenger pigeons, which are now extinct. But imagine a flock of birds blocking out the sun for three days. You know, there were more pounds of animals in what it was now the United States. There were more pounds of animals 500 years ago than there are today even with concentrated animal feeding operations, hybrid seeds, John Deere equipment, and chemical fertilization, and subsidies. Imagine, there were animals everywhere. The reason for all of these animals, I mean, there are lots of reasons for animals, I'll just share a couple of them with you. Um, one is that animals are the only way to move fertility around. Fertility, you know, the sun comes down and it photosynthetic activity, it makes, you know, biomass, green material. And that green material, you know, grows up and the soil minerals, the rain hits it and all that. And the point is that biomass and minerals and all this stuff tends to gravitationally move downhill, doesn't it? Water moves downhill, it all goes downhill. And so what you end up with are very fertile valleys and infertile slopes and, and ridge tops. So animals were a way to move this fertility around to defy gravity and carry it back up a hill. If it weren't for the animals, the hills would continually be depleted and depleted and depleted over the millennia, and the valleys would become richer and richer and richer, and you'd have a very uh, unequal ecosystem there. So it was the animals that defied gravity and helped to spread the, the, the goodies of the biomass and, and the mineral that would otherwise concentrate and move that around the landscape. Isn't that, isn't that cool? The other part of the animals was that they were the way, they were the pruners of nature. Now, today, you know, if, if, if I went out and, uh, and pruned a vineyard or pruned an orchard tree, everybody would think I was doing a wonderful thing, because we all know that that's the, you know, goodness of. Uh, um, pinching off uh, tomatoes, you know, the runners. I mean, this, this is all part, the green thumb of the horticulturalist is, is pinching and pruning, isn't it? That's what we call it, a green thumb, right? Well, because you're always pinching and pruning and, you know, fooling around with it, right? Um, that's why we have the saying of a green thumb. You get the green thumb because you're always mashing stuff. <laughs> that was the role of animals in nature. How do you prune all this vegetation to make sure that it doesn't go into a senescent state and quit receiving solar energy and converting it into biomass? Well, you prune it so that you restart the rapid succulent growth. I call the animals, especially herbivores, our biomass, re, uh, biomass accumulation restart buttons. <laughs> So this was the role of animals, okay? And, and there were lots of them. The, the first colonists who settled in Jamestown and Williamsburg, they talked about being able to hear the birds from literally miles out at sea. Uh, we know that the, uh, the wormy chestnut, which of course was all through here, uh, the, the, the chestnut, the reason we call it wormy is because it's like an apple tree. You know when you see, when you pull the bark away from an apple tree and you see all the little, the little worm things? All right, well, well fruit and nut trees especially are, have all these little bugs under the, under the bark. And that fed the birds because there wasn't anybody bringing food out to them in the wintertime. How do you maintain a population of birds that huge in the wintertime with worms under the bark? And so a lot of uh, horticulturalists now believe that our big, you know, pest problems rode the demise of the wormy chestnut because the, that's when the bird populations plummeted in this country was when the wormy chestnuts went down and the birds uh, uh, couldn't survive through the winters as well. Okay? So what that means is that an ecosystem to thrive has animals in it. So if we're gardening, you know, um, if we have a college campus, 
It should have animals. Let's mow the lawn with sheep. Let's put some let's put some chickens up against the dining services door so the, the, the trash comes out to the chickens and the chickens eat it and they lay eggs and the eggs go back into the dining services and you know it's not green to separate out the compostables to go on a on a diesel trash truck to go to a composting site to be reimported for you know ornamental azaleas. You know, that's not green. What's green is is edible landscape functioning on site with animal salvage and recycling. Now what's interesting is that as soon as you head down this path, the admissions department starts to crawl down under their seat and hide because parents tend to not want to send their kids to a place that is proximate to animals. I mean, unless they're pedigree poodles <laughs> or you know Himalayan tigers. Right. You know, it's fine to dump money and be proximate to your pet cat or your pet dog or a gerbil or an aquarium or your tortoise or a snake, but being proximate to them, to livestock, <laughs> that's what idiots do. That's what cerebrally challenged people do. That's what brown people do. Not sophisticated, college-bound, white-collar, Dilbert cubicle, working for the man, Fortune 500-bound young <laughs> So, animals. We need to surround ourselves with animals. Number two. <laughs> on this a while and created this list, it struck me just how, how elegantly profound and simple this really was. You know, you know, we live in a time, I'm giving a speech tomorrow, where the orthodoxy of our day is that animals aren't supposed to move. I mean, think about how simple, how simple it is. Animals are supposed to move. What's the difference between an animal and a plant? Well, an animal moves. And here, you know, we take the most the most reverential, special, uh, um, you know, physiologically distinctive part of animals and uh, abuse it or, 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 you know, disappreciate it or whatever. Okay, number two. Energy comes from proximity, not from outside. So you're sitting here and, and there's a lot of energy going on. I want you to think about, you know, the force of water running down a, a, a creek, okay? Um, maybe a natural waterfall, a, a, you know, a, a creek, a stream, a river. Think of the force of water, you know, you're putting your, um, you're watching it convey logs and branches and leaves and, and, and stuff. But we got water force, we got wind force. I mean, think about, uh, Maybe the day you happen to sit on your rock to meditate, you know, it's windy. And there's a tremendous amount of, of force um, uh, energy in the wind. Uh, sun, you know, there's a reason why the ancients worship the sun. I mean, on a cold day, you, you know, you come out of your cliff and you, you know, and, and, and you feel the warm sun on your back. And wow, you know, that's, that's energy. The point is that energy, that, that, that energy was proximate in situ. It was not, energy was not something that you brought into a locale from outside. Imagine if no building could bring in energy from more than 10 miles away. I mean, you gotta let the water go downhill to grab up some steam, right? You gotta let the wind get some inertia going. The, so energy, Energy needs to be thought about as proximate, as nearby, as inside rather than outside. And so when we start looking about how do you how do you get that kind of energy, we're talking about fire and biomass and gasification and wind and, and, and solar uh, and, and, and uh, water and um, and combinations of these. You know, one of the biggest problems with 
solar and wind is that they're very, you know, uh, uh, haphazard. You know, the sun doesn't shine all the time and the wind doesn't blow all the time. So when you need, you know, energy all the time, what do you do? And you know, if you if if you hook these up so the windmill pumps water to a to a cistern at a hundred feet elevation, uh, a great big pond, and then feeds it down through a pelton wheel. Now you've got 24-7, you've got a nice simple battery, now you've got amphibians in the pond, you've got all this hydration in the landscape as part of your in-situ program as opposed to a bunch of you know nickel cadmium batteries and whatever else to, to spread out the, the, the intermittent production. Are you with me? And so, so what you're trying to do is, is, is take this, this pool of energy that right now, you know, the, the pool of energy that we embrace is pretty broad, isn't it? It extends, you know, all the way over. In fact, you know, we feel like we've got to uh, send our military to parts on the other side of the country. But if we, if we put that amount of emphasis on creating in situ energy, maybe we wouldn't have to build empires around the world and we could keep our money home. <laughs> Number three, carbon does not move very far. Carbon does not move very far. About the farthest nature moves carbon is uh, as far as it takes leaves in the fall to blow off a tree. You know, they don't they blow a little bit, but not very far. Um, as far as it takes animals to eat in the valley and walk up to the hilltop. Why do they walk up to the hilltop? Because of predators. And so instinctively, they don't want to chew their cud. You know, the llamas, alpacas, giraffes, and, and, and bison, and wildebeest, and dick dicks, and, and caribou, and reindeer. You know, they don't want to chew their cud down in the valley because they can't see out. You know, they're down here uh, where they've got, they've got even got the, the disadvantage of being downhill where the predators can run down on them. And so the, the, the predation cycle in nature is one of the things that ensures that the pruners, the animal pruners, are going to chew their cud and poop and perch and poop. I mean, it's all about the poop, right? Um, and get that moved not only uphill, but pretty close to where it was generated. A lot of people ask me, you know, do you sell hay? They want to buy our hay, you know, because they know it's really good. Said, no, we don't sell hay because selling hay would be like would be like selling soil. We want that hay to go through an animal. We want all our biomass to go through the animal on site, right there. That's one reason why we buy local GMO-free grain, okay, uh, for our omnivores. The, the grain that we buy, we buy from local farmers there. Um, grain is is again. It's, it's proximate. It's a way. I'm not opposed to moving carbon around, but but a little. Okay. You don't have uh, barge loads of carbon in nature being moved a thousand miles. Sure. You know, move ten or twenty miles. Absolutely. As far as a deer can eat here and walk and, and, and you know run and lie down and poop. You know, that's about how far nature moves carbon. How far a bird eats seeds right here and then flies. You know, a couple miles away and perches and spends the night and, you know, poops off the roost and they go. Um, so, so carbon doesn't move very far. Number four, hydration occurs on site. Now, <laughs> you read my heart. Thank you. Hydration occurs on site, speaking of water. <clears throat> now, here in the mid Atlantic, greater mid Atlantic region, we don't think about water. Well, I mean, water is just so plentiful here, especially here in Asheville. I mean, what a, it's just amazing. I mean, you get like 20 inches of rainfall more than we do, just, you know, four hours north of you in, uh, in the Shenandoah Valley. But, um, but if you go very far, west of the Mississippi, you will find that almost every conversation goes to water, especially in farming. And 
it's getting so bad it's even penetrating conversations of people who aren't farmers. I mean, they actually put down People magazine long enough to not look at the Kardashians, long enough to discuss water. That's amazing. Water dis determines carrying capacity, and that is one of the single biggest limiting factors of the, of the ecological nest. <coughs> All of production is tied to water. So, how did nature hydrate landscapes? What did they do? I just, I just um, attended a conference in uh, New Mexico, and I asked the folks there that were in the permaculture and, and older than I am, and there aren't very many of them anymore, um, asked them, you know, what was this landscape like, you know? And I said, were there beavers? They said, yeah, there were beavers everywhere. The place was like a marsh. Yeah, New Mexico was like a marsh. Wow. Yeah. No, I mean, the whole place went like a marsh. But the point is that beavers and, and clogging vegetation, falling logs, and, uh, and, and, and meandering rivers, you know, uh, they, they hydrated the landscape. In fact, um, I go to Australia several times I've been there several times, and uh, there, because Australia doesn't have the kind of elevation changes that we have in North America, there's no fast-running river in Australia. All the rivers run very, very slow, because they simply don't have the elevation differences that we do. Uh, I mean, the whole place is as big as, you know, as big as the United States, and, and there's only like a thousand feet of elevation difference in the whole country, so it's a pretty flat area. And, um, and, and what happened there was that the, that the rivers, um, over time, actually built deltas. And so, so the rivers were actually higher. They actually built up uh, um, in their floodplains the silt and things like that. They actually built up so the, the floor of the channel actually raised up over the landscape. So you actually had landscape, and then you had the silt plain, and then the river like that. Are you with me? Pretty amazing. Well, what's happened now with the way they, you know, uh, tilled and destroyed organic matter and all that stuff, the water is running a lot faster. The landscape is not holding on to it, and so the rivers are incising down into these things. The same way ours do when they run fast. If you go out to, to New Mexico, and you see, um, you, you, you go just every couple of miles and there's this great big wide, like uh, 150 foot wide arroyo, dry arroyo, you know, and you ask your host, uh, you know, what is that? Of course, you know, what's, what's running up and down under dirt bikes and sand rails and, you know, uh, um, four-wheeler all-terrain vehicles and things like that. And um, you ask them, you know, what's that for? And they say, well, about 10 days a year, those things run clear to the bank, muddy, like great, great big rivers. And then you hear the grandiose plans of, of making, you know, uh, um, 10 foot pipes 2,000 miles from, you know, Wyoming to Phoenix and, uh, you know, Seattle to Los Angeles. And you hear all of these uh, schemes when actually, if we would simply mimic the beavers. What we, would, what we would be doing is creating impoundments high enough on the landscape to where you could impound water without major uh, um, you know, concrete and earthworks, gentle earthworks. If you catch it before the velocity and volume gets too big, which is what beavers do, beavers don't put dams in the Mississippi. I mean, it would take a pretty uh, aggressive beaver project to dam the Mississippi, right? Where they build their dams and their impoundments is way up around here, up at the headwaters, before the volume and velocity has gotten so big to be uh, um, inundating or, or uh, too big to tackle. And so, when we look at the way nature hydrated the landscape, it was not with big grandiose piping projects from way far away. It was with, with millions of smaller impoundments on high ground around an area that maintained base flow, springs, 
and actually reduced you know, floods and metered out water very gently from all these little impoundments during the drought. Okay. That's the way nature works. So the fact is that if all of the time, energy, and attention that's been spent on cultivating the ground to grow grain for herbivores that aren't supposed to eat it anyway had been devoted to recreating the kind of hydration impoundments that would have dotted the landscape 500 years ago, today the U.S. would be eaten, we would be flood-proof, drought-proof, and we would have created an oasis and a place of abundance that would have led the world into the remediation of everything that humanity has done in raping the earth since the beginning of time. So it's, it's not that difficult. You see, I'm not opposed. It's one of the reasons I love permaculture, because I'm not opposed to moving around the landscape. Today we don't have the beavers. So we don't have that army of animals to do all this work for us. What we have to understand is their objective stood the test of time. And if we can, if we can humbly come to, to leverage and use our big brain and opposing thumbs and, and the bonanza of cheap energy and our mechanical prowess to duplicate that pattern on site, locally, with community-sized uh, uh, hydration projects, see, we could literally, in one generation, worldwide remediate every single desert and, and pillaged acre that civilization has pillaged since the beginning of time. You know, the problem is not that we don't know how to do this and we don't know these things. The problem is that we're too busy doing the wrong things. You know, we're not lazy, but we're too busy doing the wrong things. As Dan Parsons, the founder of Ranching for Profit School, says, we become extremely adept at hitting the bullseye of the wrong target. <laughs> Number five. Seasonality dominates biology. One of the things you notice sitting on this log 500 years ago is that there is a, there is a heartbeat of seasonality. There's a pulsating, pulsing of seasonality. The, when, when certain flowers bloom, when there's an abundance of, of seed and forage, when the trees have leaves and don't have leaves, there's, a, there's an awakening and there's, a, and there's a sleeping. There is a, there is a, a, a vibrant uh, cycle and movement of life. Uh, indeed, if you just closed your eyes and you could sit still for, um, you know, for a year on that log, uh, you, would, you would almost sense a celebration of cycles as as different animals you know climbed into the mud for the winter's hibernation you know and as the as the bears went into their burrows and and uh, and then in the spring when the turkeys laid their eggs and the pheasants laid their eggs and the fawn had their babies and and um, and the fall at fire season and at the spring when nothing would burn because it was all too green and lush and wet the rest and growth busyness that surrounded us would be palpable. Contrast that with our assumption today that there should be no season at the supermarket. So if we're actually patterning a foodscape, a farmscape after nature, we celebrate the seasonality. What's wrong with celebrating the first strawberry of spring? No. Nothing at all, is it? You know, I was, um, I was up in uh, Maine uh, doing a, a program in uh, January. I was on this radio program with this, uh, with this uh, naysayer who uh, said, who said, you know, I was down at the store the other day and uh, I was having company and I wanted corn on the cob uh, for my dinner guests. Remember, remember the context here. This was Maine, January. Okay. Corn on the cob. And so I went down there, and you know, organic 
was two fifty a, a, a dozen, and the and the regular was one fifty a dozen. How do you justify that? I said, That's the wrong question. The question is, why do you have to feed corn on the cob to your dinner guests in Maine in January? I mean. All of our vegetables and our produce, the, the research we've done in our food system over the last basically 80 years has not been about how to improve its taste, its nutrition, or anything like that. The whole question has been, you know, how do we stabilize it and, and, and make it, you know, transport proof so that we can, you know, put these tomatoes in the back of a tractor trailer in California and, and have them rattle. <laughs> in the back of the truck for 3,000 miles while it comes to Portland, Maine in January. And what happens is when you do that, you get a cardboard tomato. And we wonder why our kids don't like vegetables. It's like Elliot Coleman said, he knew, he knew that he had achieved a, a superpower status when his baby carrots became a, a hotter trading item in the school lunch program than Snickers bars. <laughs> but celebrating the seasonality, and, 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 and you know this, when you go out in nature, as you go out different seasons, there's a, there's a palpable cycle. And so just enjoying and appreciating seasonality. Um, you know, since I'm on a college campus, I never want to give up a chance to, you know, infuriate people. So I'll just tell you here in Asheville, the single, the single biggest uh, academic anti-seasonal mentality in uh, education in this country is going to school when the food is not available. If you really want to be green on this campus, you'd be the first one in the country, and you're not the first ones. I've told, I've told this to every single campus that I go to. Uh, I mean, if they're if they're in any, uh, if they have any seasonal, you know, seasonality at all. And that is the only reason we go to we, we're off from school in the summertime is because that's when farm kids need to be home to help on the farm. Well, now that we're going and we appreciate and understand the seasonality and, 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 and being proximate to our food and our carbon, why don't we adjust our school year so that we're off in the winter? Yeah. And that way we can, you know, turn the heat down in the buildings and we can, we can, and we can be there when the campus can grow all of its own food and we can we can sexy it up with phone apps, you know, where the kids wake up and divide the campus into grids, you know, into little uh, tenth acre grids and the kids wake up in the morning, they got an app, strawberries are ready to pick in grid 37, you know, and all the kids use a GPS go to grid 37. You know, <laughs> Are ready in grid 48, you know, and they all over the, you know, the students just graze from grid to grid. All the time, you know? And suddenly, suddenly, there's a celebration of the cycles, and there is a visceral reminder not only that nature wants to provide and be abundant, but also that we are utterly and completely dependent on this ecological movement. And we don't levitate over it and, and uh, you know, sail off into some Star Trek fantasy world, you know, uh, drinking uh, pseudo Kool-Aid for breakfast. That we actually are moored here, we're anchored here, and we better get our anchorage right and get our womb right and caress this thing right before we go messing up everybody else's womb. So, so the, the, the first college that changes its academic year to cycle with the food year will be the world leader in regenerative thinking. There we go. All right, number six. Got to have to hurry. Number six: disturbance and rest cycles. Disturbance and rest cycles. You know. Today was a gorgeous day, wasn't it? I mean, it was, it was wonderful. But you know what? Every day is not like today. I mean, sitting on that log out there 500 years ago, imagine hearing the rumblings in the distance of volcanoes 
floods, droughts, fire. You know, in 18, what it was it, uh, 1830, uh, there was a fire out west in, in Wyoming uh, around the Yellowstone Park that darkened the sun, the, it was so, the, the ash and the smoke was so dense that Philadelphians did not see the sun for three days from a fire out west. That's what you call a conflagration. <laughs> and it was totally natural. You know, one of the problems uh, that we have today is that we've, 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 most of us who understand now anything about ecology are walking around with this great big old guilt burden on our shoulders and we're afraid to touch the environment because our historical touches have been detrimental. Are you with me? And so, so we're kind of scared. We're, we're oh no, you know, I, 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 I want to be, I want to be tender. I want to be healing. I want, but, 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 you know, my ancestors, you know, oh, we break down this, this terrible guilt trip. And, and what it creates is environmentalism by abandonment. So the only way to interact with integrity, with this wonderful ecological womb, is to lock it up in a state park, a wilderness area, some preservation thing where it can't be desecrated by the breath of man. That's one of the reasons I love permaculture, because a deep ecologist understands that there are disturbance and rest cycles, and the disturbance is the successional freshener of ecology. It is ecological exercise. Remember when Mount St. Helens blew? Blew the whole side out of that mountain, you know, blew trees over like toothpicks and blackened the whole, oh no, what are we gonna do? My goodness, now there's a new regenerated forest there that could have never been as lush and green and productive as it was because it's sitting in volcanic ash and because everything was destroyed ahead of it. Digging animals, you know, moles and voles and chipmunks and, and uh, uh, groundhogs and prairie dogs and, and, you know, Australia, you know, wombats and, you know, the digging animals um, are all a part of ecological exercise. And so when we come to the landscape, we don't need to be apologetic or paranoid about strategic disturbance if it is following a regenerative pattern that will actually freshen up and leverage things to more abundance. So be encouraged. Number seven, the waste of one is the input for the next. You know, in nature, there is no waste. Have you ever thought about that? They didn't have landfills. Uh, I think Bill McKibben coined the phrase, you know, there, in nature there is no away. You know, he said we're going to throw it away. You know, there is no away. Away is in somebody else's backyard. And so what, we're, so what we see nature doing is circles, 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 not linear, not linear movement where it finally, you know, goes off into an abyss somewhere. But no, rather cycles. The manure feeds the plants. The death, life, the you know, the, the, the life, death, decomposition, regeneration, uh, life, death, decomposition, regeneration. That cycle occurs on site. There's no ultimate loss of matter. Nature is really uh, um, great at preserving matter, isn't it? Uh, it wants to preserve matter, and of course, you know, as we know, the uh, the great soils of the world were all built with perennials and with herbivores and predators and disturbance factors, uh, uh, and, and this this waste cycling system. There, there, you know, there is no there is no waste. Um, I find it fascinating that the uh, manure management experts uh, from our state colleges are uh, uh, you know talking about manure as waste. I mean, that, that's such a travesty. I mean, it's almost immoral to denigrate manure like that. I mean, I ought to call it black gold or something. Uh, I mean, it's more valuable than diamonds. You know, if, if you're hungry, uh, you really want manure a lot more than diamonds. Trust me. <laughs> Number eight, processes are driven by local information. Processes are driven by local information. The 
The, the indigenous mindset adapts to the situation. The whole question is you sit on this log imagining this, this, uh, this world around you. Uh, the whole deal is what fits here? What fits here? And so it's bounded by the local. One of the biggest problems we have in industrial agriculture today is that we have outsourced most of the decision making that farmers make. So most of the decisions that are made are made by people you know, that aren't local. Well, if we're going to if we're going to love the land, we need to know the land. And you can only know so much. Okay? You know, you know, one spouse is about as much as you can know. <laughs> and so our knowledge, our knowledge is limited by by what we can see, what we can touch, and that means a localization of decisions. Um, nesting, what fits, what fits here. You know, it, it's only been with cheap energy and mechanization and cheap transportation that we've been able to amass, you know, animals, factories, uh, things, uh, uh, so much stuff in one spot to overrun the carrying capacity of the local ecology. You know, when it was all draft power, you know, back 100 years ago, when it was oxen and horses and mules, you simply couldn't carry enough raw stuff into a certain spot and carry the finished product out of a certain spot, uh, um, except for a certain magnitude, you know, because the transportation was laborious and it was, it was expensive and it was, it was slow. But today, we've been liberated from that boundary. with cheap energy, with, a, with an aberrant kind of uh, luxury that spawns in our brains the idea that we really don't have any boundaries anymore. And that's a dangerous place to be. Number nine, as we sit on that log, what we notice is that, 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 that the ecology around us is, is centered primarily on perennials, not annuals. Now I'm sure in this crowd, that's not, a, when I talk to inner city foodie crowds, I have to spend a little bit of time uh, explaining perennials and annuals. But I expect this crowd is with me on this. Uh, you know what perennials and annuals are. And that's good. Um, uh, this is a savvy, savvy group. Um, but. You know, nature doesn't have that many annuals. Annuals are, are a, a very short-lived um, ecological blip. You know, uh, th there, are, there are plants that come into a disturbed area, for example, just for a real short period of time. Uh, they grow, they die. The, the, one of the reasons that nature tends toward, number one, is there wasn't anybody to plant them, but number two is simply energy flow. You know, a perennial concentrates its energy in its root structure, an annual concentrates it in its seed structure. Because the annual assumes that, that it's the seed that's going to carry it forth. The perennial says, I got to put all my energy in the roots. So if in a drought or a flood or whatever, I've got something to hang on to or a bank account of carbohydrates to send forth new shoots when things, when you know, when the weather gets better. Okay, and so that that tension between perennials and annuals in nature always sees perennials win out. What is the probably the single uh, uh, most significant feature of U.S. ag policy for the last 60 years? A subsidy of annuals. Six of them. Corn, cotton, soybeans, sugar, wheat, and rice. So official U.S. policy is subsidizing annuals. Annuals require tillage and are soil extractors, debilitators. Perennials are soil builders because of the difference in the energy cycle. Perennials are far less risky because you don't have to take the blanket of vegetation off the earth for them. They're like pump organs 
uh, pumping organic matter into the ground. That's how perennials work. So what we want is a system, and of course uh, permaculture is big on perennials, right? Um, to, to push perennials forward. And finally, number 10, what we'll see on our blog is a plethora of polycultures. We're not gonna see monospeciation. Take me to any place and show me where nature thrives in monospeciation. Doesn't happen, does it? It's all about diversity, multiple species, everything, symbiosis, synergy, complex relationships. All of these uh, uh, intricate relationships actually block pathogenicity. They create synergisms. They, they create uh, uh, stacking effects. That's another permaculture concept is the stacking. So you're not just a linear in-out uh, uh, deal, but you're actually um, viewing a, a farm or a food system as a, as a reservoir of captivating energy that's simply building and building and building with a very small little leap that you're controlling, uh, that, that's, your, you know, that's your income stream. But polycultures. And of course, I don't need to tell you all that our entire food system right now depends, doesn't it, on monoculture. And boy, you know, we see those tin combines going down through there, Kansas wheat field, and we go, oh, wow, you know, we get this big machismo, you know, testosterone lift, and look at that, you know, that's powerful, and we're big, and we're mighty, you know. <laughs> when actually, the poorest, the poorest multi-speciated backyard garden is more productive per square yard than the most magnificent GMO, monospeciated field of anything. That's the truth. But polycultures are very hard to measure with Western linear reductionist science. Too many variables here. You know. And so it doesn't get very much attention. It's much easier to do our research and our science papers on linear single speciation. And so that's, that's where the studies go. And we compare this single species to that single species. And this linear reductionist, compartmentalized, disconnected, democratized, individualized, fragmented system to this Greco-Roman Western reductionist, fragmented, systematized, disconnected system. We don't compare it to a beautiful, magnificent, symbiotic, holistic, related, connected, we more than I type of synergistic system. It's way too complicated. How do you write that in the report? How do you put that in the, you know, in the little synopsis of the experiment? But that's what we see in nature, isn't it? Is polyculture. And so, so when we build our systems with these very intricate relationships, then we get tremendous benefits. One of the, one of the uh, biggest polycultures we're seeing leave now is the ability of a person to actually interact with food. You know, we're, 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 we're singularly moving hazmat suit to go visit a farm. <laughs> You know, and, and the, and the monospeciation is creating tremendous collateral damage. Are you all in North Carolina aware of this um, uh, epidemic porcine viral diarrhea? Yes. Yeah, it's big. Started April 1st last year. You know, good, uh, you know, good, it wasn't an April Fool's joke. And since April 1st last year, the U.S. has lost... 25%, that's one out of every four baby piggies born in this country has died in the last 12 months. Futures for hogs. Hog futures? I don't know how many of you are playing hog futures. But <laughs> listen, I'm 
picked up a Wall Street Journal. I was out speaking, you know, and I, I get these big, heady newspapers when I go out to speak and stay in these hotels, you know, and they get free New York Times, Wall Street Journal. So, you know, I get them. I'm a pretty interested guy, you know, and this stuff. And when you see pork futures on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, that's a big deal. And the line from like January 5th to February 5th went straight up. It doubled in 30 days. Never have it happen. It was such a big deal that, that, that Wall Street Journal was on the front page. That is nature saying, you know what? I bat last. And what I've described to you, I think, are nature's paradigms. And when you look at each one of these, you realize that right now, our culture has basically thumbed our nose at every one of these things. One of the principles of paradigms that Joel Arthur Barker pointed out when he wrote the book Paradigms about 35 years ago and introduced the word to the world was that every paradigm, right when it appears to be perfected, is on the brink of collapse. And what we're seeing now, E. coli, Campylobacter, Listeria, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. I mean, who heard of these words 30 years ago? They weren't in the lexicon. I mean, I went all the way through high school and never even heard that word. Not only not that, I didn't even hear the word, the phrase, food allergy. I didn't even know the word gluten existed except in the culinary arts. Autism? We didn't know anybody that had autism. Now it's gone from 1 in 10,000 in just two decades to 1 in 68. What? 1 in 68. Autism. That's the newest figure. It was in USA Today last week. Read it. And whatever USA Today says, I'm sure it's true. <laughs> here's, the point, here's the point I'm saying. Here's the point I'm making. I'm closing. The point I'm making is... I know there's a lot of depressing news out there. There's a lot of pushback from the industry, from Monsanto, from the U.S. Dove, and the F. Dove, and there's a, <laughs> there's a tremendous amount of pushback against people who appreciate nature's patterns. But I'm here to tell you that ultimately these patterns will prevail. It's not a matter of when, it's just, I mean, it's not a matter of if, it is just a matter of when, because these will prevail. And what we're seeing now, from health to mental illness to, to, the, to um, infertility to all sorts of, of issues, I mean, you know that now in Arkansas, I was in Australia, there was a Bayer Corporation lady next to me getting her luggage off the rack. I said, that's interesting, what are you here? She said, I'm here at, a, at an international symposium on herbicide resistance in Perth. Okay. She said that now in Arkansas, far, corn farmers are budgeting in $70 per acre to hire machete-wielding people, laborers, to go in and chop down the, 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 the mutated super weeds created by glyphosate uh, resistance because the weeds are so gigantic and big now that have survived the GMO, the, the, the herbicide onslaught, that they're tearing up $400,000 combines. So they have to physically by hand remove them from the field so they can combine the grains. Folks, that is a crack in the paradigm. That is the brink of collapse. Okay? And so at one point, you know, it'll be a disturbing time. Wall Street might collapse. <laughs> but if you have a local centric system that is following these ecological principles, it is immune to Wall Street. It is the ultimate freedom, self-reliance system. It's the best investment we can have. Okay? So take heart, be encouraged, and, and appreciate that nature bats last. She has a balance sheet. And as we, as we implement this kind of biomimicry and pattern duplication, where we live, locally, 
in our place, in our space, we will come humbly realizing that our great epiphany came from meditating on a law 500 years ago, observing the patterns of nature. Thank you very much. Yeah. God bless you. on Farmageddon and what you see with local, uh, state, and federal governments uh, affecting small farms, and have you been personally affected? Sure. The question is, uh, I don't know, how many of you have seen the documentary Farmageddon? Farmageddon? Good. Oh, boy, man. I, you, this is, this, it's really happening here, isn't it? This is really cool. All right. Good. Uh, this is a documentary, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, about the assault of uh, what I call the food police, um, uh, the orthodoxy uh, on the heretics that um, would be so bold as to, you know, buy raw milk or, well, actually sell it on milk. It's fine to buy it, you just can't sell it. Um, <laughs> You know, I find it fascinating that in our uh, uh, U.S. Duh and F. Duh culture, um, in their orthodoxy, it is perfectly safe to feed your kids Mountain Dew, Cocoa Puffs, Count Chocula cereal, and uh, um, Snickers bars, uh, but it's unsafe to feed them uh, compost-grown tomatoes, raw milk, and um, homemade uh, pickles. So, so uh, you know, this is an amazing thing, and what we're seeing uh, is like you see in any disturbance is that the status quo as it starts to see itself um, lose market share is try to circle the wagons okay and create protective uh, barriers from competition from heretics like us and so this is happening as we speak and and I think it is you know the most significant occurrence right now in our culture um, my view is that when the government gets between my lips and my throat, I call that an invasion of privacy. <laughs> and yes, I do believe we should legalize all drugs. All of them. Because a government that can tell you that you can't snort coke can tell you you can't drink raw milk. Okay? And so, um, uh, we... We are, we are at a point where this, this um, manipulative mindset over nature, our, our culture comes from a very um, mechanistic, manipulative view of life. In fact, one of the orthodoxies of our culture is um, that, that life is fundamentally mechanical and not biological. You know, when I, when I have a class of kindergartners at the farm and we go out and we, we, we're with the cows and uh, I ask them, you know, uh, what do you call an animal that eats only meat? You know, they say carnivore. You know, what's an animal that eats only plants? Herbivore. Now, the big bonus question, what if one eats both? You know, omnivore. And I point to the cows and say, what are those? They say, herbivore. And I say, can anybody tell me why? our country's most expert, accredited, academic, PhD, credentialed experts for 30 years took farmers like me to free steak dinners to teach us a new progressive scientific way of feeding cows where we grind up cows and feed them to cows. And all the kids go, yeah, yeah, that's stupid. You know, that <laughs> you know a 10-year-old has way more sense than an egg-headed uh, a PhD, all right, and so and and so so this is the orthodoxy, and so what's happening now with the Food Safety Modernization Act, with with uh, HACCP, Hazardous Analysis Critical Control Point, and with insurance companies who whose executives collude with the uh, with the industrial community. So you've got insurance, you've got regulators, and you've got industry. Uh, it's not a conspiracy. You say conspiracy, everybody says you're enough, right? So you can't use the word conspiracy. What it is, is a fraternity of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> They've all drunk the Kool-Aid, all right? And, 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 you know, for me, the most powerful part of the, of the documentary Food Inc., and I'm sure most of you have seen that, um, the most powerful part of that documentary was 
um, was at the end with the with the uh, business cards flipping back and forth. You know, where industry went into you know regulation, regulation back and back, 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 back. I did. I had the privilege of being invited to California by the uh, California uh, Health Department and Department of Agriculture um, to speak to about a hundred um, food safety um, regulators in California about. Um, food choice, food safety, and artisanal cottage industry local centric food systems. And uh, this was just about, you know, two years ago. And so when I started, I asked for this room, oh, these were all, you know, uh, uh, food, you know, food safety experts. Um, I asked for a show of hands, I said, I'd like to know how many people here have seen the movie Food Inc. Not a single hand went up. Wow. What you have to understand is we live in two completely different worlds. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't any good bureaucrats on the face of the earth. You just have to look really hard to find them. And the good ones are pounded down every time they have an innovative idea because the bureaucracy is so huge, so massive, that, that, that you know, it, it can't withstand creativity. The bureaucracy is there to preserve the status quo. And what happens is now our status quo has moved away from these tried and true patterns and we have a totally new set of patterns that are aberrant and destructive. Okay? And that's our status quo. People ask me, well, why don't more people, you know, it seems so intuitively, I mean, what I just said to you didn't it sound practical and reasonable. Yeah. Why don't people endorse it? Well, the answer is, if this became common, Again, if it, if it did, it would completely invert the entire power, power, position, prestige, and profits of the entire food and farming system. And that's a big ship. It's a lot of inertia. Okay? And so, that system will not go gently into the night. I'll, I'll, finish, I'll, I'll just mention one more story and then go on to the next question. Um, uh, I was I was I spoke to the um, to the National Trade Association of Institutional um, Dining Services Dining Services Institutional whatever um, bosses <laughs> and um, and in, in Denver uh, Colorado and uh, the next day I, I I rode the shuttle bus back to the airport and there were two of them two dining services you know. Um, coordinators on the bus. We got to talking and I did not realize that these dining services um, chiefs actually get personal vacations and kickbacks from Cisco and Aramark and the big food services companies for volumes of, uh, of, of use. You know, every hundred thousand dollars or more use, you know, you get other little, you know, basically coupons, and you get, you know, vacations in Hawaii, and you get all this. And personal, this is at state colleges, taxpayer money, personal kickbacks. There's a lot, and we're not. I just, you know, the, 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 the fact is that the that the status quo has done a lot to insulate itself from innovation antidotes to the problems they've caused. That's the problem. And the problem is that when we arrogate, when we arrogate things like food safety to the federal level, now you're gonna hear my libertarianism come out. When we, arrogate, when we arrogate this to the federal level, then it doesn't allow innovation to occur at the state and local level. And so what happens is every time we arrogate to the federal level a solution, it inherently eliminates the wiggle room that state and localities could do to solve those same problems. So instead of having 50 different ideas to solve a problem, we have only one. And that's the tragedy of arrogating to the federal every problem in our society. States, different story. You know, lots of innovation, it's a lot smaller, it's more a human scale governance. Okay? 
Um, but the reason that we have such political dysfunction in this country is because we have arrogated everything to such a large scale that it's a winner-take-all battle. And when it's a winner-take-all battle, the, the stakes are too high. And so uh, uh, you, you have to have a, a tremendous amount of concessionary uh, regulator buy-off and, 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 and political activity to deal with the winner-take-all mentality. And so what happens is the government becomes in the, uh, essentially a marketer of special concessions and chips you know, out here for the regulated. And the biggest regulated, of course, have the money to buy the concessions and the special loopholes. The fact is, if the federal government weren't, able, weren't selling anything, there wouldn't be anybody there pumping money in it to buy. The way to eliminate the lobbyists is to eliminate the special interests and concessions that the government can sell, because then there wouldn't be anything to buy. See, And if it were done on the state level, on the local level, then it's not a winner-take-all, and one state can do a totally libertarian approach, one can do a whole socialistic approach, one can do top-down, one can do bottom-up, one can, you know, whatever. And, you know, let the state that has the, 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 the least amount of prisons and the least amount of hospitals be the policy that wins. <laughs> But right now, when I say I want the freedom to be able to buy and sell to, to, to the food of my choice and the farmer of my choice, like raw milk or compost-grown tomatoes, the regulators think I'm asking for new uh, epidemics of, of, um, of disease and sickness. Dirty farmers. What are we going to do about you know, this? You know, unhealthy food, blah, blah, blah. And, and the problem is our side doesn't have a track record anymore, see? And so, so what we desperately need is some wiggle room to allow localities and states to self-govern, remember, local-centric decision-making, all right, so that we can have numerous options on the table to try them out and see what works. And then other people can say, oh, they're doing that over there, oh, they're, they're doing, ooh, that's a new idea. What they're trying to do, you know, they're, they're, they're not even going to let people own land. They're going to they're going to do it by tribalism and a, and a talking stick and uh, you know consensus <laughs> and a big bomb. You know, wow, <laughs> look, you know, they, well, they don't have, they don't buy and sell land anymore. It's not a commodity. Ooh, you know, got, I mean, why can't you try a bunch of stuff like that? You see, the the, the problem is that we've become a country too big to govern. And so that's why we need to uh, reduce the power at the top. And that's another whole topic, but anyway, that's a long answer. I've got time for another question. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. How is a geoengineering aerosol spray affected Aerosol, boy, you've got aerosol spraying affected agriculture? Oh, chemtrails. You know, um, I've looked at all that, and... and um, well, I mean, there's stuff going on, all right? I'm going to answer that this way, and it's a punt, and you'll be disappointed. But you know what? There are a lot of things going on in this world that, that are, 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 are beyond me. I, I, can't, I, I can't stop the Jets. I can't stop the Pentagon. I, you know, Stephen Covey in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, one of the habits is stay within your sphere of influence. And so... I guess, I guess my answer, and, and, and I don't like them, okay, I don't like any of this manipulation stuff, all right, I mean, let, let's be clear, I don't like, but, but there, there are some times when you, you can get so, whatever, uh, you know, ulcerated and, 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 and bleed off your energy about things that are just outside your control, that I guess what I like to see it's okay to, you know, to write letters, be informed, and, and, and understand it, but, but please don't neglect your patio container garden, your beehive, and your, and your raw milk supplier, and, 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 your, and, and, your, and your culinary arts, and your kitchen, and your, and your larder, and your dehydrator. Are you with me? Um, and and, and so, uh, so do that with the leftovers. Don't let that be the, the thing that guides you, because I've just found it, it's, it's just too depressing. It's too depressing to be to be negative and fighting and fighting all the time. We've got to be positive and be seeing soil grow and spring grow.
And so, you know, if we can, if we can inspire people with, with examples that lead and really, uh, by our, uh, by our, our vibrant countenance, magnetize and draw people to this mission, um, I, I, my sense is that, that that will get us um, farther than militating against things. And there are plenty of things to militate against, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, but you know, I guess I would like to see us all just um, buy lands, you know, uh, go buy your raw milk, sell your raw milk, go to jail. They can't put us all in jail. I mean, be a civil disobedient. I mean, um, you know, you can and, uh, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get farther. I think sometimes about doing positive things than, than fighting against the negative things. And I know there's a balance there, okay? But, um, but for me, I, 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 guess, I guess my sense is generally um, some of these great big issues, sometimes I just kind of, you know, put my thumb in the air and say, you know, which direction is Monsanto going? Whatever they go, I'm going the opposite. I don't, I, I don't have to read all the laws. I don't have to understand it all. All I know is that if the USDA wants it, Monsanto wants it, um, I don't want it. <laughs> it, it, it simplifies things a lot. <laughs> okay, now listen everybody, may all your carrots grow long and straight, may the radishes be large and not pithy, may, uh, may blossom in rot um, affect your chemical uh, farmer neighbor's tomatoes, not yours. <laughs> May the, may the coyotes be struck blind at your pasture chickens. <laughs>